Um, welcome. Today I'm talking about VPC Private Link. Uh, my name is Gina Morris. I'm an engineering manager on the VPC team, the EC2 networking team. Uh, if you don't know, VPC, VPC is Virtual Private Cloud. Uh, I'm going to cover some basics on VPC, but if you haven't learned a bit about VPC before, I suggest that you go and have a look at our VPC fundamentals talk. If you look on the AWS YouTube channel, that'll get you up to speed with some more of the basics and allow you to fine-tune a VPC. But today, it's private link. So private link allows you to easily and securely use or, or offer or share services between your VPC and other VPCs. You can also securely use AWS services from inside of your VPC without letting any of your traffic traverse the internet. So what's our agenda? What are we looking at today? Firstly, I'm going to tell you why. Why should you use Private Link? Then I'll go over, as I said, some VPC basics, some of the fundamentals that you need to know to actually use Private Link. Now, this is an intro talk. It's a 200-level session. Uh, so we're going to cover some of the basics. And the easiest way to, I think, teach people about something is to do a bit of a walkthrough. So we're going to do some walkthroughs looking at how you would share a service, how you would use AWS services, and then how you would actually consume or use a service that has been shared with you. And then lastly, I'll go over some example use cases so that you can actually see Private Link in action or, or kind of get a, a good feel for how it might be able to benefit you. So before I show you how, I'm going to show you why. And there are multiple benefits of Private Link. But I'm going to focus on three of the main benefits to start with. But I'm sure you can find more if you actually poke around and see how it can benefit your business. So the first thing is that it's secure because your traffic does not traverse the internet. It's really easy to use, and it simplifies your network management, especially at scale. And lastly, Private Link can help you to migrate your, your systems from your on-premise location to the cloud, or to operate in a hybrid model. So Private Link allows you to create a private link between your own VPC and a service, either an AWS service or a shared service running in some other VPC, even if that other VPC is in a different account. You get a private IP, you get an elastic network interface, and you can apply security groups to that interface. This means you get to control exactly what traffic goes to that service endpoint. And again, your traffic does not traverse the internet. So it's almost as if the service is running inside of your VPC with only private IP connectivity. Private Link really allows you to simplify your network management. And the way that you get this statement of it simplifying things for you is that without being a networking expert, and I'm sure some of you are, I'm sure some of you are really, really capable. You could do all of this already using some of the other building blocks that we've provided. But with Private Link, you're reducing your, your um, you're reducing your opportunities to make small mistakes. You're reducing the time you have to spend maintaining those. You're not having to maintain special firewall rules. You aren't having to set up path definitions, root tables. And if you're sharing a service with someone else, either a customer, um, another team within your department, something like that, you don't have to have them also deeply understand the core networking. They can just use your service and get it right and stay secure in VPC without having to be a networking expert. And lastly, but definitely not least, uh, this can help you accelerate your migration to the cloud and can help you operate partially in your own data center and partially in VPC. So if you have your on-premise data center connected to your VPC using Direct Connect, your private link endpoints, your VPC endpoints in your VPC are going to work over that direct connect connection. That means that you can stage your migration 
You don't have to do kind of a lift and shift and move everything over at once. You don't have to go and connect to AWS services from your data center over the internet. You don't need to do any of that. You can create private link endpoints, VPC endpoints in your VPC and connect to them from inside your on-premise location. You could also potentially keep all of your own data inside of your own data center, but actually have your applications running in your VPC. There are numerous ways that you can hook this up together to simplify things and allow you to do your migration or your hybrid uh, model stage by stage. So, as I said, there is an entire talk on VPC fundamentals. It's actually called VPC Fundamentals, so it's easy to find. You can look it up on YouTube. And really, I do suggest you watch that to help you get uh, kind of the basics and to help you fine tune your VPC for your own use case. But today, I'm going to focus on a few basics that are relevant for private link. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, so. Hopefully, it's enough for you guys to get the basics, and hopefully, it's not boring for those of you who've seen them before. So we're going to cover subnetworks, subnets, and availability zones, and how you can use those to deploy higher availability applications. We'll look at routing traffic. We'll look at, once you can actually route traffic, how do you stop getting the traffic that you don't actually want? How can you be selective about that? And lastly, I'm going to touch on an element called an elastic network interface, or an ENI. We don't usually cover this. It's a fundamental. It's kind of a virtual networking device. However, it is very relevant to private link. So subnets are, as the name suggests, subnetworks of your VPC. And they're how you use your VPC to deploy high availability applications. And they're relevant for private link because when you are creating a private link endpoint, when you are creating a private link endpoint service, so when you're sharing a service using private link, you want that service and you want that endpoint to be available in multiple availability zones for redundancy or potentially for lower latency. So AWS has a global infrastructure. We have uh, 18 AWS regions. And when you create a VPC, you're selecting a region. Your VPC crosses an entire availability zone. I mean, an entire region. Availability zones are next. So each region is divided up into two or more availability zones. And each availability zone is made up of one or more data centers that have redundant networking, redundant power, they basically have completely separate failure characteristics. So that if something happens in one, you've got redundant setup in other availability zones. And when you create a subnet, your subnet is a subnetwork of your VPC within an availability zone. So we want to send packets. And that kind of brings us to routing, which is one of the core concepts of VPC. Now, caveat, routing isn't really directly related to private link. However, it is related to VPC endpoints and vaguely related to private link. So I'm going to touch on it anyway. So the way you do routing in VPC is with route tables. And route tables are a simple, easy to read list of rules that says when traffic is destined for IPs in a specific range, send that traffic to a specific gateway. You can set that up by VPC, but you can also override it on a subnet by subnet basis. So here is an example route table. And this is saying traffic that looks like it's going to the IP address range of my VPC should be routed local. It should stay within my VPC. That's pretty simple. Sometimes that's what you want. You don't want your traffic going anywhere else. Any of your instances start trying to send traffic to the internet, you're going to drop it. But sometimes you do want your traffic to go to the internet. And so you create a route that says traffic that matches 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, that means everything, should be sent to an internet gateway. And an internet gateway is a highly available virtual device 
It's a gateway that sends traffic to the internet. Now, it's not a single point of failure, it's an abstraction over something highly available. And sometimes this is what you want, right? Sometimes you want to be able to send traffic to the internet. But often you're in a situation where you don't want to do that. Now, here's an example of, I mentioned that you can, um, when you create a route table, by default, it'll apply to your entire VPC, but you can override that on a subnet by subnet basis. So here's an example that shows how or why you might want to do that. So we've got some yellow web servers, and we've got some blue back-end servers. And the yellow web servers take requests from the internet, and in the course of handling those requests, they turn around and they make a request to the blue back-end servers. So we have two distinct groups, two distinct groups of connectivity needed here. The yellow web servers need to get requests from the internet. So we're going to create a route that allows them to send traffic and receive traffic from the internet by routing to an internet gateway. The blue backend servers, they only ever need to get traffic from the yellow web servers. They only need to know about that local route. So we're not going to give them a route to the internet. Now, why do you care? Why not just have everything routable from the internet? Well. How many of you have compliance or auditing requirements? You can put up your hands if you like. Yeah, you see, it's pretty prevalent. Some of you might have those requirements and not even know it yet. It's going to be a fun surprise. Um, so you might have compliance or auditing requirements where maybe you aren't able to or aren't allowed to send certain types of data over the internet. So you don't want your backend servers which handle that data being routable from the internet. Others might just want to take a bit more of a belt and suspenders approach to security. You just want to make doubly sure that nothing is ever happening that you don't know about. And that's fine too. And private link is really awesome in this situation because private link is not going to be sending your traffic over the internet, so it doesn't need you to have a route to send traffic over the internet. You're able to preserve this um, not being routable behavior while still being able to use AWS services or services that are provided from another VPC. So security is important. We've just been talking about compliance, auditing requirements. Often that's for security. And so the way you do security in your VPC is by using security groups. And security groups are a powerful yet simple tool that in a typical data center or traditional data center, you would achieve using firewall rules. In private link, security groups are relevant because you can actually apply a security group to your private link endpoint. And that means you can say, hey, these particular servers in my VPC are allowed to talk to this VPC endpoint, and everything else is not allowed to talk to that service. So if you think about it, say you have you know, connectivity to my logging service, you could define a group of instances that are allowed to send traffic to my logging service, and everything else won't work. So let's look at that same example we had before, our yellow web servers, our blue backend servers. And because they're two different groups, there are two um, sets of, I guess, different security considerations, and all of the members of each group share a common purpose. Different rules apply. We want to allow web traffic to our web servers, and we only want to allow our web servers to talk to our backend servers. So the web servers example is pretty simple. We're going to say allow all HTTP traffic to instances that are in the web server group from anywhere. Right? So they can get these web traffic requests. We already spoke about them being routable from the internet. That's fine. How about this? This is a little bit more interesting. So this is the security group for our backend servers. And you can see the source isn't a, a set of or a range of IP addresses. It isn't the list of IPs of the servers that are in our web servers. It's another security group. Now think about how flexible that is, how powerful it, that is as a tool. You're in EC2. The E stands for elastic. You want to be elastic, you want to be dynamic, you want to be scaling up and scaling down. 
And this makes it really easy, because with security groups, as you're launching instances, changing the sizes of your instances, as the IPs are changing, you aren't having to maintain those rules manually. They're just getting updated, and you're just getting the access that you need between those two groups. So you can really practice the principle of least privilege without ever having you know, that sneaky little IP that was one thing becomes another thing, right? I'm sure anyone who's managed firewalls themselves in the past by IP is familiar with this problem. OK, elastic network interfaces, also known as ENIs, are virtual networking cards in VPC. And fundamentally, when you send a any kind of network traffic or when you receive any kind of network traffic on your instances, on your load balances, the, that traffic is coming from and going to elastic network interfaces. This is obviously between instances and between other resources in VPC. So it's a virtual networking card. It has a private IPv4 address. It has potentially secondary IPv4 addresses. It can have public IPs. It has, if you opt in um, to IPv6, you'll have IPv6 IPs. Uh, you typically will create one, or when you run an instance, you'll already have an elastic network interface. And in those cases, you're actually managing the network interface. And that means you have permission to do attachments and detach and move it around and so on, delete it. Uh, but certain resources, like load balancers, uh, like private link endpoints, when you create those resources, we create elastic network interfaces in your account on your behalf, and we manage those for you. And what that allows us to do is have things that are running inside of your VPC, acting as part of your infrastructure, allowing you to apply your security groups for you to really have control, but we'll take care of putting all the pieces together to make it work. And the last relevant piece here is that you apply your security groups to elastic network interfaces. So those are the main basics of VPC. Again, there's a lot I didn't cover here. I also went over that pretty quickly. So if you want to learn more about VPC, please go and watch the VPC Fundamentals talk or have a look at the documentation available on the AWS site. So let's look next at how to access, how to securely access AWS services from within your VPC. There are two ways of doing this. And both ways are using VPC endpoints, but there are two different types of VPC endpoints. The first is gateway VPC endpoints, and the second is interface VPC endpoints, which is why I threw in the elastic network interface part there. So let's have a look at gateway VPC endpoints before. They work just like all of the other gateways in VPC. So we looked at that internet gateway earlier. These are going to work very, very similarly. And the key thing there is that you route traffic to them using a route table. So let's look at your VPC without a VPC endpoint today. I'm going to use S3 for this example. So let's say you have your application. Your application is running in EC2. And you have your data. Your data is stored in an S3 bucket. Now, your data is kind of a part of your application, right? Those two things need to work together, or you need your data to be able to, do your, to deliver your application. And so you need to access your data from your application. Now, if you go and, in your instances, resolve the DNS name for your S3 bucket, you're going to get a public IP, which means you're going to need an internet gateway or some other way of going over the internet to S3 to fetch your data. But we've just spoken about this, and we've said there are really good reasons why you may not want to or be able to go over the internet, why you can't have your traffic traversing the internet. And that's where VPC endpoints come in. So with gateway VPC endpoints, they support S3 and DynamoDB. And you send traffic to them, as I said, by routing. So here's that same example we just looked at for S3. And fundamentally, what's going to happen is you're going to create a VPC endpoint using the VPC endpoint console. And you're going to, or the APIs, 
For those of you who use the APIs, I'm sorry, we're doing a lot of console today. You can also use the APIs. Um, and then you're going to create a route in your route table. And your route is going to say, any traffic that looks like it's destined for S3, send that traffic to the VPC endpoint. And it's just going to work. You don't have to change your application. You don't have to update your code. You're just going to start sending traffic to that VPC endpoint. And if you're not using your internet gateway or your NAT gateway for anything else, that's it. You can take it away. You're done. So the next type of VPC endpoints are interface VPC endpoints. And these are VPC endpoints that are built using private link. Now, interface VPC endpoints are supporting a bunch of services today. Um, I had a count, but since then, we've launched a few more. So we're just rolling out VPC endpoints, interface VPC endpoints for new services all the time. In fact, I think in the last few weeks, we launched support for SageMaker, CloudWatch Events, a couple of others. And what happens here is when you create a VPC endpoint, so imagine this is the, the same as that S3 example. You're trying to use the EC2 API endpoint. When you resolve the DNS for that, you're getting a public IP, and so you have to go over the internet gateway or something. When you create a VPC endpoint, an interface VPC endpoint, what actually happens is we're going to create an elastic network interface in each of the subnets that you specified with the security groups that you specify. And when you send traffic to those private IPs on those ENIs, that traffic is going through your VPC endpoint and to, your, um, to the service that that endpoint is fronting. So it's as if now the EC2 APIs are just running inside of your VPC. Remember, this is a highly available virtual device. It's running on something highly available, and it's not a single point of failure. When you create a VPC endpoint, an interface VPC endpoint for an AWS service, you're going to get DNS. And you're going to get one DNS name that is regional, so when you resolve that inside your VPC, you're going to get each of the private IPs, all of them together. And you will also get zonal endpoints. You'll get zonal DNS, which means if you want to keep all of your traffic within a specific availability zone, you can use those zonal DNS names. Now, you can see I had to put some ellipses in there because they didn't fit on the screen. They're quite long. They're made up of the VPC endpoint ID, the service name. And that's OK. But if you are using AWS services, we can make this even simpler for you. If you have allowed AWS to manage DNS on your VPC, this is a VPC setting, we'll create Split Horizon DNS. So we will set up DNS inside of your VPC that when you resolve the normal service endpoint, it's going to resolve to the IPs, the private IPs of your VPC endpoint. And that means your software is just going to work. It's just going to start using the VPC endpoint without you having to change anything. So we, we we launched VPC endpoints for AWS services a while back, but last year we gave you, our customers, the ability to share and use third-party services using VPC endpoints and AWS private link. And this is across VPCs, but also across accounts. So I'm sure some of you are you know, dealing with situations where you have a lot of VPCs. I'm sure others are dealing with situations where maybe you have a bunch of different accounts that you've acquired either through acquisition, maybe that's just your system design to kind of keep things segregated. Um, and this allows you to actually start sharing services between those accounts and those VPCs. So we're going to talk about how do you share a service as the service provider. 
Maybe your team or your company builds the logging service, the monitoring service, something like that. How are you going to make that, that service shared across VPCs and across accounts? Once you've done that, let's look at how your users or your customers are actually going to use those shared services. And then lastly, let's have a look at, as a customer of some third-party services, how can you start using those third-party services over private link? And these are specifically services that are available in the AWS marketplace. You can, of course, use shared services in the normal kind of direct share model as well if you have third-party providers who prefer to do that. So let's look at sharing across VPCs, regardless of account. And uh, we're also going to touch on, if you are a, a marketplace seller, uh, an AWS partner, how can you make your software as a service offering available in the AWS marketplace over private link? What do you get for that? So let's look at sharing services today. This is very simplified, but let's say you have your service. It's running in EC2 and you probably have some kind of load balancer in front of your service. In, re in um, reality, your systems are probably a little bit more complex than this, but you know, this is the basic idea. And you're running in your VPC, and you have a user or a customer who's running in some other VPC somewhere. And they've got their instances, and those instances want to access your service. They want to be able to talk to your load balancer. Now. There are a few ways of doing this. I'm going to focus on just doing this over the internet because we've kind of been using that along the talk. So what you could do here is you could give the VPC that the service is in an internet gateway and create a route to the internet gateway so it can actually receive traffic from the internet, give your load balancer a public IP, all that kind of stuff. And you're going to need to do the same on the user's VPC, the consumer VPC. Now, both of these VPCs are routable from the internet. They're able to send or receive traffic from the internet. And at this point, you would be able to use the service in the service VPC from the instances in the consumer VPC. And a lot of the time, this is fine, right? A lot of the time, this is going to work just fine. But as we've been discussing, there are a lot of reasons why you might not want to or be able to do this. And there are multiple options. Um, you know, you can use peering, you can use NAT gateways. There are a variety of options. But private link is the preferred way to share services directly between VPCs. And that's because it's going to easily allow you to keep your data secure and it's going to allow you to really simplify the management, especially when you're sharing your service with a lot of different users. So there's only one real requirement compared to the setup we had here, your load balancer in front of your service. There's only one real requirement here. And the requirement is that you have a network load balancer in front of your service. Now, a network load balancer is a TCP load balancer um, and you go to the load balancer console, it's in the EC2 console, and you just follow the wizard and create a network load balancer. You select the availability zones. We suggest you use multiple availability zones. This allows you to have lower latency because you're in more different availability zones, and it also improves your fault tolerance because of that redundancy. And that's pretty much it. Once you've got your network load balancer, you're going to go to the VPC endpoint service console. And here you're going to follow the wizard. And all you do is select one or more network load balancers. So a keynote here, if you have a very large service or if you're wanting to kind of split traffic between multiple services that are you know, A-B testing or something, you can have multiple load balancers here. All of your customers, your users, will be mapped to one of those network load balancers. So their traffic will go to one of the load balancers that you have specified. They won't be going between those load balancers. At this point, the only other option that you have to look at here is this acceptance required. And checking acceptance required means you're going to review requests from consumers, requests from your users on a case-by-case -case basis. If you don't check this, 
every time someone is allowed to request to share or use your service, it will automatically accept that request. And voila, that's your service, it's created. Now, your service gets created. Uh, I'm going to step through each of the tabs on the console view here and tell you what they're about. But on this first details view, the main thing to take note of is the service name. Because the service name is what you are going to use when you share your service with someone else. This is what you are going to give them for them to be able to discover and find your service. So in the Network Load Balances tab, you can change or just review your different network load balances. In the Whitelisted Principles tab, so you don't want to just randomly have requests from anyone. So you have to, regardless of whether you are requiring acceptance, whitelist specific IAM users or roles or AWS accounts to say whether they, whether they are allowed to make requests to use your service. The endpoint connections in this example is blank because no one is yet sharing this service. No one is yet set up or requested to share this service. So we'll come back to this in a moment. Lastly, notifications. So this is super useful. You can set up notifications so that you get notified every time someone, for example, tries to connect or makes a request to connect to your service. And this is really useful if you want to automate some of that review and approval process that we spoke about when you're accepting, when you're requiring acceptance and so on. So if you are making your service available over Marketplace, if you are a, a partner and you want your service to be, or your service maybe already is available in the AWS Marketplace, you can register to have your software fulfilled over AWS Private Link. Now, there is a really large pool of customers who aren't who can't use third-party tools because of lack of trust in how that data is being shared. Not necessarily lack of trust in the third party, but kind of what's between their VPC and that third-party service. Now, thousands of customers are using Private Link. And if you're a third-party service provider, you want to tap into that pool of customers who can't currently use your service, but who would be able to use your service if it was offered over private link. So that's one really good reason to go and onboard in the marketplace. Another enhancement you get if you make your service available over AWS Marketplace using private link is you get a, a vanity DNS name. So by default, when you create a service, the base DNS name is made up of the service ID, um, and when endpoints are created for your service, they are made up of the VPC endpoint ID plus the service ID and so on. If you're an AWS Marketplace service, you get a vanity DNS name. So you get to simplify that, and that makes it much easier for your customers to recognize your service, and it also simplifies TLS integration or TLS termination on your service. So let's look at how you actually use the service, because that's pretty much all there is to sharing a service. It really is pretty simple. So how do you use the service as a customer? So again, you go to the create endpoint part of the console, um, and it's really it's the same sort of thing as what happened when you created an endpoint for an AWS service, except you're checking the second option. You're going to enter that service name that was provided to you, and you're going to hit Verify. And Verify is checking a couple of things. It's checking, is this a valid service name? Have you made it up? Or is it actually a real service? And it's also checking that you're whitelisted to actually make requests to that service. If both of those check out, then you're going to go ahead and specify your VPC. You're going to specify the subnets and the availability zones that you want to create that VPC endpoint in. So you're going to select one subnet for each availability zone. Now remember, you want to do this in multiple availability zones for redundancy and lower latency. 
And then lastly, you're going to select your security group. And this security or these security groups will be applied to all of those Elastic Network interfaces that are created as that service endpoint in your VPC. At this point, you're going to see this, pending acceptance. And on the service provider side, it's also going to say pending acceptance. And it's going to show that until the service provider goes in and actually accepts that request. Once you accept the request on the service provider side, it's going to start moving from pending into available. And at that point, the VPC endpoint is ready to use. And it's going to be reflected on both sides. You can see the DNS names exactly like we had when we were looking at AWS services. When you send traffic to those DNS names, it resolves to the IPs, the private IPs inside of your VPC. And it's now as if that service is running inside of your VPC. So if we look at it in pictures, on the service consumer side, you are sending traffic to this private IP, and that's sending traffic to the endpoint, which is going in turn to this cool shared service. What's really happening behind the scenes is that traffic is going to that network load balancer on the service provider side and to their service. And all of this is happening without you having to have any kind of internet access or anything like that to share that service across VPC. It's secure and it's easy to use, it's going to scale. You also get DNS. And if you want, if you want to simplify this a bit, you can use Route 53 to make a C name of your choosing that will point to this VPC endpoint DNS name. So we spoke about, when we were talking about creating your service or sharing your service, we spoke about um, vanity DNS names and other things that you get if you make your service available over the AWS marketplace. So I'm going to show you just a couple of the extra steps if you want to, as a user, consume one of those services over marketplace or through marketplace. So Simply, you start by browsing through the AWS Marketplace and finding the service that you actually want to use. You want to look for this little icon here, which says Fulfilled by Private Link. That shows you that that service, that software, is available using Private Link. Next, you're going to subscribe. So far, this is basically the same as anything else you've done to use third-party services over or through the Marketplace. So you're going to subscribe, and then it gets familiar again. You're going to go back to that Create VPC Endpoint console, and you're just going to select the third option, which is to use your Marketplace service. The only difference here is you're going to get a list of, of VPC Endpoint services that you have already subscribed to using the Marketplace. Now, if you don't see what you're looking for in the Marketplace offering private link, you should reach out to them and ask them to onboard with Private Link because, as you've just seen, it's really simple to onboard. So, you know, a little bit of a push in the right direction. So, that's basically the walkthrough of how to actually use Private Link. It really is very, very simple and it allows you to easily keep your data secure, stop it traversing the internet, and all in an easy and scalable way. So, Let's have a look at three use cases um, of how you can actually use Private Link or how you can leverage it. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just a few examples that tie back to those benefits we spoke about. So software as a service providers, they often collect data. And I know with the ones I've used before, you install some kind of an agent on your, on your instances, say, and that agent sends data or has an agent that um, sends data that reports back to the provider, right? They're gathering that data, and then they're able to make some beautiful graphs for you and so on. But there are customers who can't use those third-party tools because they can't send their data over the internet or they don't want to. And they therefore have to choose between allowing internet access or not using this third-party provider. With Private Link, you don't have to make that choice. Your data is never going to go over the internet, so you can have no internet access and use that software as a service. 
So we spoke a little bit about compliance. So let's have a look at a, a specific example, maybe. So personally identifiable information, or PII, is specific information that cannot traverse the internet. Both PCI and HIPAA compliance have requirements that state this kind of data cannot go over the internet. With private link, you're able to confidentially share data because you know that that data is not going to traverse the internet. So now you have a way of getting your PII data between your VPC and another VPC. And lastly, again, not least, uh, migrating to a hybrid cloud model. With on-premise applications, you can now use private link to connect to AWS services or services running in other VPCs over Direct Connect. This means that you can start to try out sort of how it feels to use various AWS services, have part of your applications running in AWS without having to move everything over all at once. Having a staged migration, really being able to tackle your migration one piece at a time is going to simplify your life so much. And all of that while keeping traffic within your private network, right? So let's recap. We've been through the steps of how to set everything up. I spoke about some of the use cases. We spoke about the benefits. So I'm going to touch on the benefits again. You have control of your data. Your data is secure. It's not traversing the internet. You can apply security groups. So you can really control exactly what can send data to those endpoints. You can practice the principle of least privilege in another way in VPC. Private link is scalable. It's easy to use. It's easy to use both for you as a, as a service provider or as a user. Now, think about that. If you're a, a networking expert and um, you, know, you know how to do this, your customers may not know how to do this. You also you don't want to waste time doing all the little things, making sure everything's right, when you can very, very simply share a service and know that it is secure. And you can accelerate and simplify your migration to the cloud or your migration to a hybrid cloud model in a lot of different ways by simplifying and staging your migration. Private link is the recommended way to share services between VPCs. It's secure, it's scalable, and it's really, really easy to use. Now, this was an introductory talk. I went through pretty much all of the basics, all of the different uh, types of users that might be using it. So if you are interested in private link, there is a lot of information and some more kind of deep dive webinars and sessions online. So you should definitely go and check that out if this is going to interest you. Thank you very much. Remember to submit sub session feedback. Thank you.